Thanks very much for joining me, Felicity. Um, and just to recap, we'll be talking a little bit about Indonesia's naval modernisation and Indonesia's maritime policies. Firstly, welcome back from Indonesia. Thank you, Nat. It's great to be here. Excellent. So, I mean, let's start obviously with the topic of the day. President Jokowi has come into power, and with that, he's had a heavy emphasis on maritime policies. Let's just give uh, an overview of what those maritime policies are. Yeah, indeed he has. I think Jokowi, in his inaugural speech, tried to recall Indone Indonesia to a former maritime nation. Um, so the, the five main elements of his policy are um, maritime culture, um, sort of food security, or really talking about fishing, um, maritime diplomacy, um, maritime economy, where he's really talking about port infrastructure, and the fifth one is maritime security. Um, so of those five, I actually think that there are three that are much more important than the others. Yeah. And those are the, the fishing, um, the maritime security or the sort of naval aspect, and thirdly, the port infrastructure, because I think that maritime culture and maritime diplomacy are at the moment policies that have not been detailed and they're just not as tangible as the others for us to really get into at the moment. I mean, it's funny looking at Indonesia being an archipelago, I mean, some might think that, well, how come it doesn't have a heavy maritime culture already? Why would the president need to re-emphasize that? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think if you look at the history of Indonesia or modern Indonesia since independence, um, there really hasn't been a leader until Jokowi who's really grasped this maritime concept. And I think it was really only 100 years ago that the Dutch drew a big circle around the archipelago and said, you know, this is um, a collection of islands and, and what has become the modern state of Indonesia. And Sukarno in the 1950s and 60s, he had a vision for a big navy, but it wasn't um, well executed, shall we say. Um, and then under Suato, there was a lot of focus on land and agriculture. So I think um, Jokowi's vision for a maritime nation is, is new for Indonesia and very important. And the other thing I'd mention is that there are many million Indonesians who actually live on large islands and they have no need or um, reason to go to the beach or, or to see the maritime environment. And also they're very poor, so it's actually very expensive to get between islands and not all Indonesians have that opportunity. Okay, well, why is it that Jokowi has turned his attention to the maritime domain? I, th I think there's a couple of reasons. W one of the um, sort of hesitations about Jokowi as a presidential candidate was his fo foreign policy experience. And right now some of Indonesian, um, Indonesia's foreign policy issues are actually really in the maritime domain. So for example, there's um, China is quite assertive in the South China Sea and there are sort of um, disputes a around um, the maritime territory in the South China Sea. Um, there are piracy and other sort of trade issues in the Malacca Straits. And also there's illegal fishing in Indonesia. And there are some estimates that that could be up to $8 billion a year that Indonesia is losing from lost revenue. So if Jokowi can really get on top of the maritime domain, it shows that he's the leader of this big country in a geostrategic location of the, um, you know, at the crossroads of the Indo and the Pacific, so between the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Mm -hmm. um, so that puts him on the map as a statesman. And it also shows to his um, people within Indonesia that he's a, a strong person on foreign policy. But it's not going to be a cakewalk. I mean, Indonesia is, as you said, it's a large country. It's at the centre of all of these these great sort of strategic uh, sea lanes of communication, amongst other things, trading passages. It, it, why? Well, what will it take for Jokowi to realise those goals? What's it going to take for that to happen? Well, I think one of the big issues is money. So um, Indonesia still faces a lot of domestic challenges um, in terms of social welfare. So every dollar that is spent on big ticket items such as marine ports or maritime ports or the Navy, that's a dollar that is not spent on health, education or welfare. So I think like Yudiono, um, Jokowi is going to face challenges in actually getting the money. And there are some other challenges. Um, so for example, in the security area, Indonesia has something like 14 civilian agencies that have a role to play in um, the civilian side of maritime security. That's just the civilian side, right? That's just yeah. the civilian yeah. side. Okay. And then they have the Navy um, on the military side. But to be honest, that sort of um, framework of maritime, civilian and military um, security governance is a bit of a mess. 
And I think until that is streamlined, um, you know, Jocko is still going to face some challenges. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, and, and you know, fill out, fill out the details for me here, but there's some confusion about whether there are Coast Guard vessels or there are naval vessels that respond to particular agencies or which agency has jurisdiction, whether it's fisheries. Um, is that the sort yeah, of challenge we're talking about? Absolutely. And, and I think that unlike other countries such as, say, Singapore, um, th there is no one Coast Guard. So even within that sort of Coast Guard realm, if you like, there's actually multiple different agencies um, who may be trying to operate in the same sphere. So it's, it's very complicated and it's, um, it's difficult to sort of make traction um, in, in that sense. And then, you know, and then it's difficult to have a delineation between the Coast Guard sort of organisation and the Navy and who does what. Okay. Sounds like that's an infographic. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's just actually turn away from civilian matters mm -hmm. and turn to the military matters. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Felicity, you finished your thesis most recently on Indonesia's naval modernisation and why that was wrapped up after 2004. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to tap into your thoughts about well, what is going on with Indonesia's naval modernisation? Yeah, I think um, so. So the, the time period that I focused on was really the last 10 years, so under Yudiono. And the first thing I'd say about the minimum essential force, which was the, the big policy for Indonesia, which covered the Navy as well as the Army and the Air Force, is that the key word there is minimum. So Indonesia recognised that they didn't have enough money to develop a, a whiz-bang sort of fancy um, Navy or defence force. And so they're really trying to pare down to what are the bare minimum things that they require. And so in the naval space, um, Indonesia would like to keep a fleet of submarines, so they have two very old um, submarines at the moment and they've signed a deal with South Korea um, for three new submarines to be built both in South Korea and also in Surabaya at um, a, an in Indonesian facility. Um, and then some surface combatants and some s smaller patrol vessels um, that Indonesia has invested in. Um, and also Indonesia looked at sort of streamlining and reorganising um, the, the naval organisation, um, but that hasn't been achieved yet. So I think where the Indonesian Navy is now vis-a-vis -vis their modernisation plans is that it's made a few steps um, sort of in, in the right direction, but it still needs a lot more money to realise its goals. Um, and secondly, I think one of the key areas where they fall short is that they don't have um, good surveillance systems um, and you know aircraft to be able to monitor what's going on in the archipelago. So I would say at any given point in time, it's actually really difficult for Indonesia to know who's in their waters, let alone actually securing them. I think you had an interesting fact in the discussion that we had before. Um, what can you give me an example of the state of Indonesia's surveillance capabilities? Yeah. So one analyst that I spoke to, he actually said that um, that Indonesia is using some aircraft that you know, a decades old and actually using binoculars to wow. try and work out what's going on in terms of their surveillance in the Malacca Straits. So that is a very different operating environment, if, if that's true, to, um, to say Singapore or even Malaysia's systems. Well, certainly highlights the fact that it's a priority area for the country. Yeah. Um, let's turn now to uh, some of the maritime policy. Uh, let's turn back now to actually who's in charge. So. One of uh, members of Jokowi's cabinet is, her name is Susie Pujastuti, and of course she's the new Minister for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries. I wanted to bring her up because she's a bit of an interesting character, and um, as you and I discussed, her, her background seems to be quite pertinent to bringing Jokowi's maritime policies to life. Let's just start with a little bit about who she is. Yeah, so I think um, Susie's definitely an interesting character and probably someone the media has grabbed onto a little bit. She's a bit, bit of a rock star of Indonesian yeah. politics right now. She's kind of sidelined Jokowi, I think. Yeah, so she's got tattoos, she didn't finish high school and she's um, been a fishing entrepreneur and also been involved in aviation. But I think there's two key elements of her background that will be really important going forward for um, her role in the um, maritime affairs sort of um, department is firstly, I think she gets the scope, the sort of breadth and depth of what is the Indonesian maritime environment from her involvement in fishing and also aviation. Um, and secondly, I think that um, her involvement in the fishing industry is really helpful in, in curbing or, or helping out with that particular issue in Indonesia. So for example, she understands the cold supply chain requirements of getting 
cold fresh fish to market. Um, and so I think she actually um, bought some aircraft in order to you know, make that happen in her business and became very wealthy as a result. But also she understands that there's actually different markets to sell the fish. So if you get cold fresh fish to a local market in a remote part of Indonesia, that's a very different price to getting it onto a table in Hong Kong or Taiwan or even Australia. So I think with that background and also that entrepreneurial sort of spirit and get up and go, that um, she's definitely one to watch. Yeah, I think the idea is that she's quite no nonsense, mm. um, putting it that way. Um, and look, she was in the media in December again. Indonesia was, uh, was it was remarked that they were pushing this illegal fishing policy by burning boats. So Jokowi has announced that they will have you know, no, no remorse in burning boats belonging to other countries that are caught illegally fishing in Indonesian waters. She came out and said that she had alerted all the ambassadors in, uh, representing Southeast Asia and said that this was their policy. And so far they've burnt Vietnamese boats and possibly Thai boats. I just wanted to pick your brains. What's the significance of that so far, given that Indonesia's done this in the past? What is it different? What's different about it under Jokowi? I think that Jokowi has been very public about um, Indonesia deliberately burning vessels, um, as you say, from Viet Vietnam and potentially Thailand, that were operating illegally within Indonesia's maritime jurisdiction. And I think that Jokowi's intention there is to assert his authority um, and to assert Indonesia's authority over its own um, jurisdiction. So um, I think that that's significant, but it's also a very dangerous game to play. So as, as we've talked a little bit about the Indonesian Navy, um, it, it is one of the weaker navies in the, in the entire region and the Chinese Navy, the PLAN, is also operating in those waters. So Indonesia has got to be pretty careful that it doesn't um, escalate an issue by burning a fishing boat of a, a neighbouring state and then um, it going a bit pear-shaped. Yes, of course. And like you said, you know, there are neighbouring states who are illegally fishing in the area, but also Japan and mm. China and other countries. So yeah, obviously there are risks there. Um, speaking about fishing, and you mentioned earlier about cold supply with fish, uh, it reminds me of a story in a book written by Elizabeth Pisani, a former Reuters journal who's now an epidemiologist travelling through Indonesia, about how it's easier for Indonesian fishing, uh, fishermen to sell fish by travelling an hour or two to the Philippines than trying to make their way through Indonesian back channels. Um, it's a book that you and I have, have read recently, um, and it's a book that one of its main themes is about how Indonesia comes together as a state, how its 16,000 islands somehow make it work. I wanted to ask you, because it's such a good book that I love recommending, what did you find was really good about it? Yeah, Nat, I think that um, the best thing about the book was that it did try really hard to get a grasp of what it is, this concept of the entirety of Indonesia. So um, Elizabeth Pisani, I think, made a big effort to um, go to the dominant sort of cultural and political island Java last on her travels. And I don't think that's a big spoiler alert that's in the table of contents. But, um, but also, you know, she really tried to, um, you know, she went to the Eastern Islands and she went to places like Sumba and Sumatra and Kalimantan. And I think it really brought to life some of these um, very interesting things about what it is um, that Indonesia is as a nation. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I was thinking, I was like, my God, she really had to travel by all sorts of means, took whatever boat she could. She had to wait a day or two. Um, some of these trips would take ages in relatively shaky mm. vessels. I'm um, really hammered home to me um, how access and transport are still challenges amongst some parts of Indonesia. And like you said before, not all, or not all Indonesians can make it around the archipelago mm. or have a sense of, of coast. Um, I was just, yeah, I was taken aback actually how bold she was in actually doing that, but demonstrating that quite that point quite well. It's such a big archipelago. Mm. And uh, you've just returned from Flores as well, haven't you, from the yes. Eastern Indonesia. Was there anything in particular there that, that sort of was interesting to you? I, I think that uh, definitely the, the sort of waiting around for the, the next boat or the next um, bus was something that, you know, that, that I experienced when I was travelling there. Um, but also I think what Elizabeth Pisani touched on was the kindness of the Indonesians. So I had an experience where our motorbike broke down at night and we had no fuel because the fuel gauge uh, on the rented motorbike didn't work. And there were probably 10 people who stopped on the road to make sure that um, we were okay. And they actually siphoned petrol from their own motorbike and then followed us all the way home to make sure that we got there safely. So you know, a very warm and welcoming country 
um, that yeah. is probably forgotten or, or not touched on as much for people who haven't had that experience. Yeah, no, it's certainly a book that I keep hammering home to people to read if they haven't been interested in Indonesia mm. before. So hopefully in a couple of years' time, if maritime policies have been stitched up and access is, is much more available, hopefully we can go and visit the rest of the islands. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks again for your time, Felicity. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Nat.